Take your Bible and turn to the place where Apollo 8 read from the scriptures the first time they made their first orbit around the backside of the moon. Turn there. See what you know. Apollo 8, Jim Lovell, the first, very first time man left the gravity of the earth. Apollo 8 didn't land on the moon, but it was the very first time that man left the orbit, the gravitational pull of the earth, and traveled 235,000 miles, and for the very first time, went around the back side of the moon. And when they came around, and I have that on my computer screen, they grabbed a camera and they took the very first photograph of the earth from the moon. Very first time it had ever been seen. Incidentally, and this is a true story, um, the Flat Earth Society um, issued a statement and said, we are going to rethink our position. <laughs> Not kidding you. Because they, they saw then, for the, they really, they believed it. They saw the earth from the moon. It was televised. And they said, oops. Maybe we were wrong. Does anybody know what they read? Jim Lovell read from the scripture. And, it, and if you remember, Madeline Murray O'Hara. She was that militant lesbian atheist that was constantly griping at the government for inclusion of religion in government. And she wanted this total separation, a wall of separation between government and anything related to Christianity. She complained to NASA. She complained that Jim Lovell dared. He was an emissary of the United States government mixing religion with his governmental mission. And she made big stink over that. But he read Genesis 1. Turn there. I mean, they, he thought about this. He thought about, you know, I'm fixing to be the first person to ever see the earth from that distance. And he thought about what would be appropriate to say to the world at that moment. And, you know, you have poets, you have songwriters, you have famous authors for the last thousand years. And he had a pick of anything. He could have read, he could have wrote his own words to say. But what Jim Lovell thought, and he's not a Christian man, what he thought was appropriate was reading the story of the creation from the King James Bible. And this is what he read. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. Notice that word. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And I don't think he read the whole chapter. But he read those first few verses out of the book of Genesis. And every time I see that, I, I marvel at that. Um, let me just give you 
couple things on, I'm, I may talk about the moon landings this week. But let me say this. There's a lot of people who say they faked it. NASA didn't go to the moon. And they give all these reasons. Now these are, these are backyard scientists. In other words, they're not scientists. They're men who dream up conspiracies. And, you know, I had heard, you know, Aline Estes, if you remember her from years ago, Charlie Estes, she told me, she said, Charles, never believed they went to the moon. He said, they faked all that. I've done it in Hollywood. You'll never convince me we went to the moon. He was just that, he talked that way. But, you know, I've watched a lot on, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so astronauts were my, they were my heroes. And I wanted to be an astronaut. And so I read everything I could. I've watched documentaries. I've watched all kinds of things. And I'll say this. You can believe what you want. You're going to anyway. But you have over 400,000 people, literally, from the moment Kennedy said, we're going to make it a goal to send a man to the moon and bring him back safely. From the moment he said that, you had contractors. NASA was hiring every engineer they could get their hands on. And if you, were, if you went to college and became an engineer, you had a job instantly. NASA was going to hire you. And they put people to work, and there were factories all over the country that were making components of these rockets, components of these spacecraft, the lunar lander module, the command module. They were making all of these parts, all of these instruments. You had scientists not just in America, but all over the world, who were working on the math of how to get a man beyond in Earth orbit and then beyond Earth orbit, and then how to bring him back. You had people building computers. You had, and some people say, you know, what good did that do us that we sent a man to the moon? That doesn't benefit us. Take your phone out. Okay? Understand that your phone, like this tablet, is a computer. Who remembers in 1962 what the size of a computer was? Football field. Almost, right? They had to fit a computer in the lunar command module. The computer was going to navigate... Because calculations were too much. They would have never been able to do that by hand. They had to have a computer on board. So <clears throat> the engineers designed a way to take a warehouse monstrous machine and bring it down to about this size to fit it in the Apollo spaceship. Okay? And that was the, one of the first time that instead of using big, remember those TV tubes? That was the computers they used. And instead of using those, for one of the first times, they were able to use transistors about that big. So they were able to get the computer down to a smaller size. And you and I are the beneficiaries of that technology. And there's lots of other things. But let me tell you this. Here's what I'm going to say. There are too many people in this world, too many people who actually have a legitimate education and have the scientific background who, if we faked it, they would have immediately said, hold on a second. The calculations don't work. Your machines are bogus. There's no way, mathematically or scientifically, we could have gone to the moon. China would have erupted. Russia, the Soviet Union was in a, a huge war with us over who could get to the... And it's, what's funny is, when we sent Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins to the moon, Russia had sent a ship in advance, an unmanned spacecraft, to try to land on the moon before we got there. While our guys were going to the moon, the news came out that the Russian spacecraft missed the moon. And it's lost in space to this day. Okay? They never made it. 
If we would have faked that, Russia would have called us on it big time. They would have exposed it to everybody because they were competing against us. And what I'm saying is there's just too much scientific knowledge of how we did actually get there, how it would have worked, how it did work, people examining this who actually know something that would have said scientifically there's no way it could have been done. So I think we did it, okay? And I actually have Bible verses behind this, and I'm not going to share that tonight. But let me, let me start with it. In fact, let's go to the Lord and word of prayer, and, and I'll get into the scriptures tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for gatherings here tonight. We thank you for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we thank you that Jesus died for us, that he rose again. We thank you that we are saved. We thank you for the fountain filled with blood. We thank you, Lord, for creating us. And Father, when I look at the moon and the sun and the stars, I don't think that it's an accident that we're here. Everything that you made, you had a purpose for it, a design behind it and everything that we see in this world tells us that there is a creator and you're that creator and father we worship you tonight <clears throat> as our creator and you're the creator of a very special creature and that's man and the gifts that you have given to man are, are boggling they're staggering to our hearts and Father, we thank you for being so good to us. Even those, Father, that never worship you, that never believe in you, they are the benefactors of the good earth that you've given us. So Father, bless your word tonight. Bless us as we go through it. We love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Genesis, the very, this was what I was reading this week. Uh, I got my Bible out on the way home yesterday and I reread Genesis 1 and I knew there was something there that God was going to show me. I didn't know what it was, but verse 31, and that's what I have up on the screen. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was what, what did he say about it? It's very good. Not just good. He said it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And I want you to understand that God gave us this world to live in as a gift. Okay, we've been to the moon. When they, Buzz Aldrin said, I can't remember the words he said, but it, the way he described the moon was like this big, huge void. There's nothing there but powder and rocks. Nothing there but rocks and dirt. No plants, no air, nothing to filter the sunlight out. It's a barren wasteland. That's what it is. Well, God gave us something far better than that. Your own backyard tells you that, okay? So I, I meant what I said this morning. I told you I was going to show you some things that I saw this week in Alaska, and I'm, I'm so glad. It was my wife's idea for us to go there, and I have her to thank for it. But it just really has blessed my heart. Uh, the first day we went to Mount Rainier. This is Mount Rainier. And unless you've actually stood... This, you're, what we did was we rode a gondola up to the, the, one of the next highest peaks next to Mount Rainier. And you're on the top of this thing. I'm going I'm to guess at maybe about 14,000 feet. There's not much to breathe up there. Okay? And one guy told us that works there, he said, when I started working here, it took me two months to get used to this air. Two months to get used to it. And so anyway, but it was just, it was... Unless you've actually seen with your eyes a mountain like this, seeing a picture doesn't do it justice. You just, you just see the, the, the tremendous size of it. You see some of the details that a picture just doesn't show you. But we were, you know, like where we were standing, there's a, a valley that separates us from the top of Mount Rainier. And it was just a blessing. This picture here, one of the views that we got from the cruise ship that we were on. I've not altered this picture. This is the color that we saw. Um, and I even have better pictures than this that I couldn't, I couldn't pull off my phone in time. 
But what it is, it's the sun being at a longer distance away than it usually is and at a low level in the horizon and all of this clouds and water and fog that's filtering out different colors that the sun sends out but leaving the blue spectrum. So everything here looks blue. The clouds are blue, the mountains are blue, the water's blue. Again, this is the actual color of everything that we saw. Here's another version of that. Just absolute stunning. You know, we'd step out on the balcony of the ship and this is what we had to look at. I don't know why people were wasting times at the bar and the casino. When I got a much better buzz out on the balcony of our, of our room. Pictures like this, it's a different color now. And again, I've not altered this picture. This is the actual color that we were able to see. So this, the sun is probably higher up in the sky. So what's being filtered out is some of the colors like red and yellow and things like that. And you have the greens and the blues now coming through. It's another version of that. With the, that we saw there were clouds and fog and mist everywhere up there. Here's a, this, this, the, you can see more of the colors here because the sun's out a little bit. And so all of the, the color spectrum is allowed to come through. And uh, like I say, all of these mountains and all these hills and all these forests, just y it looks like they're on fire. Uh, but it's just this constant mist. Like, and that reminds me of Genesis 1, before the flood, there was a constant mist, the Bible says, that came up from the ground. And that's, that's a lot of what we saw up there. Oh, I didn't know I put a video on here. But I'll take it. I'll let that play a second. Anyway, th it was things like this that we were blessed to see practically every day uh, of this cruise. I think this is in the port city of Ketchikan, Alaska. All right, go to the next one. Hello. How do I do this here? Now what? Hmm. Can I go back? No. Well, it's giving me options, giving me a menu, but none of them apply to... Let's try... Let's go, let's do that there. Let's start that there. There we go. That's a fungus that grows on the side of old dead trees. And, that, and we were told that the fungus uh, emits an enzyme that helps break the trees down. It only grows on dead trees. And once they start growing, they actually consume the tree. They're using enzymes to break down the wood fibers that are in the tree. And that's what helps it. Turn back into the, God designed a system so that everything that came up out of the dirt turns back into the dirt. There's a saying that says Mother Nature keeps a clean house. And it's true. Everything that dies and falls to the ground, Mother Nature takes, she covers it up and turns it back into something that's usable again. Uh, I don't remember if these berries were edible or not, but they were pretty. There's my eagle. That is my eagle. He's standing on a rock and the beach here is just covered with these mussels, these shells. They're not edible by human standards because they have a red tide, they have a bacteria in them. But these eagles sit on there and they just pull these mussels out of those shells and feed them. They break them with their beaks and they feed on them. This is that same eagle up in a tree. You can see his mouth open. And he was screaming the whole time. Aah! We were in his area. And he wasn't happy about it. So that's him telling me, turn that camera off. Okay. That is a little seagull that lives in a nest. The mama seagull was there and the mom, we saw the mama go out and grab food and come back and bring it to the little baby seagull. And that's at the port in Seattle where the ship landed. Here's our whales. There's a mama whale there on the lower right and a baby whale. And the highlight of that 
was there on the bottom, the baby whale gave us a flipper. The baby whale came up, turned sideways, and waved at us. I'm not kidding you. Uh, but anyway, what I was telling you this morning, I'm going to repeat to these ladies here. These whales, let me see if I can, okay, right there where I've got that arrow pointed is Juneau, Alaska, which is where we saw the whales. Now, I want you to look at this area. It has fjords, channels, islands, coves, everywhere. And these whales, they always know exactly where they are. Because we were told that you can identify each and every whale because every one of their tails is different. Even if, it, even if it's the same species of whale, the tail has markings or it has little buttons on it that are unique to that whale. And they had a picture book of all these whale tails and they had given names to each one of these whales. Okay? And they said these whales come back here to this same spot every year. Where do they go? They start out here in Juneau, Alaska. They, they fill up, they get real fat in, this, in these channels here. They feed on krill, small shrimp, very small fish, things like that. And they get, they get full of fat, full of energy. Then they migrate 3,000 miles southwest to Hawaii. They go down there so the mama whales can give birth. As the mama whale's going down there, she's going to lose, lose about a half a ton in weight. She gets down there, she gives birth to the baby whale in that warm water, teaches the baby whale how to swim, how to come up for air, how to go down for fish. And then they migrate all the way back again to these exact same spots because the guide said... This whale here was here last year and we identify it by its tail. So we know it goes down there and it comes back. So I asked the question, how do these whales know where Hawaii is and how do they know to come back to this exact same spot? The tour guide said, we don't know. You ought to see her, she's going... I know who knows. Science doesn't know. So here's what you, here's what science wants you to, here's what Bill Nye, the science guy, wants you to believe. He's so smart that he believes the whales figured out how to navigate three, a 6,000 mile round trip journey that their genetics developed a system for navigating the seas by accident by themselves. That those whales, by an accident, found the Hawaiian Islands, which are out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. There's nothing around there that you would, there's no signposts, there's no mountains, there's no roadways, no land, nothing. They want you to believe that whales evolved to be able to go down there and back all by themselves. And I think that guy's an idiot for believing that. I have a God who leads birds when they migrate, who leads whales when they migrate. He led Israel out of Egypt to a land that they didn't know how to get to, and he's leading us to a land that we don't know how to get to. Amen? If God can lead whales to this exact same spot, he can take us to the promised land. Amen? All right. Now, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at what God has given us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. This is going to be day six now of creation. This is the last day and the last thing that God does. He doesn't make man first. He makes the heaven, he makes the earth, and he makes everything else. And I want you to notice that he made man last. We're dead last in, on God's creation list. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind, cattle after their kind. So we're talking about, you know, cows, goats, lambs, deer, elk, antelope, cats, dogs, gophers, 
pigs. Everything that walks on the ground. And remember, God made them out of the earth. He says, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. So again, when all of these things die, where do they go? Half of them go to our stomachs. Amen. But then they eventually end up on the ground. Eventually, they all go back, whether we eat them and we die and go to the ground or they just die, they go to the ground and God's good earth cleans up her house. And this is why you don't see animal carcasses and animal bones laying piled high everywhere after thousands of years of animals dying is that the earth turns them back. It has a way. It's like that mushroom I showed you that secretes an enzyme to eat that dead. The tree's already dead. So this fungus only grows on a dead tree. It doesn't kill a tree. It just cleans up the mess of a dead tree. You and I have built into us the bacteria that's going to eat our bodies up once we die. Our immune system is fighting it off now. But the moment we die and our immune system becomes inert, then that bacteria that is in us is going to eat us up and turn us back into the minerals that we are. We're, we're copper, we're gold, we're iron, we're zinc, we're nitrogen, we're carbon, we're all the things that you would find in the earth. That's the components of our body and, and it's going to be turned back into the dirt. So God made the beast after, of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And here it is again, God saw that it was good. And again, I just encourage you, go out. Go out to a farmer's pasture and watch his cows. Just look at his cows. Or go out somewhere and sit in the woods for a while until you see deer come by and just watch them. God made them, and they're beautiful. Deer, squirrels, even skunks are pretty. They stink, but their fur is pretty. There isn't anything, I think, that's ugly about this creation. What you might call ugly, we would just say it's unique, it's different. But God made it, and he made it good. Amen? And all of these things, then, are a gift to mankind. So now, after he's created all of the other creatures, every creature on the earth now has been made, and they're... Roaming the earth. Then on day six, the last thing God does. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. One, two, three. That's why we sang holy, 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 Lord God Almighty tonight. Because I had that in my mind. This is God in the plural now. There's a few occasions in the Bible where God speaks in the plural Another place is Genesis 11, where God said, let us go down and see what they're doing. Let us do that. And so that's what you have here. You have who's, who's, some would say, well, God's speaking to the angels. The angels did not have any part in the creation. I don't know if you realize that, but God did not issue instructions to the angels to create any part of this universe. This was all done by the mouth of of the Lord. So God is not talking to angels. This is not the UFO alien who's talking to the council of aliens saying, let's seed the earth. This is God speaking to God. God speaking to God the Son, God the Spirit. Thus you see the plural three times, us, our, our. So God, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And we are the only creation made that way. God is not a gorilla. He does not look like a gorilla. God does not look like a chimpanzee. And the difference in the DNA between a chimpanzee and a human, even though gorillas and chimpanzees have human-like features, 
chimpanzees look more like us than cats do, or goldfish, you have 97% of the DNA is similar between chimpanzees and humans. It's a 3% difference in the DNA. And look at what that 3%, look at the difference it makes. Chimpanzees did not build a monument like the St. Louis Arch. They couldn't. You know, I watched, you know, that movie where they made, where they set those first two pieces down, Sterling. You remember that? How did they line those two pieces up to where, when they got to the top, they met perfect? Chimpanzees, huh? Yeah, well, that was, that was like this way. But I'm talking about the first two pieces, and they were angled in. They were lined up perfectly, because if they weren't, they'd have to tear it down. It wouldn't last. Chimpanzees could have never done that. 3% difference in DNA is what makes that kind of difference. 3% difference can take a man and put him on the moon and bring him back. 3% can make the computers that make the phones and the tablets and the TVs and the cameras that we all use. That's the difference between us and chimpanzees. In all the years that chimpanzees have been on this earth, they've never made a house. They've never even made a wagon to carry stuff in. But we have. You see, I, I'm one of these where God has given us the ability to make our station on this earth better. And over, have we not, over the years, provided more comforts for ourselves and a better way of living for ourselves? To, I don't see that necessarily. I think there's a line that man's going to cross. But just man making his house better to live in, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's what's in us. Yeah. Is it not? Having our relation, having, having tribes not wanting to kill one another, but having peace, between, being able to reason things out instead of going to war, those things make our living on this earth better and God has given us that ability chimpanzees do not have that gorillas don't have it so that's the part of God that he put in us the ability to take care of ourselves the ability to make our comforts more comfortable to be able to feed ourselves better all of those things God has endowed to man but Man's going to cross a line one of these days. Okay? So just anyway. Oh, by the way, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, which is why we can go out and catch fish. Which is why man saw that men were killing too many whales. We don't need whale blubber anymore. We don't need it. We have other things that we use instead of whale blubber. Man sees that man's killing too many whales, so man says, we need to stop doing that. Nature doesn't care. Animals don't care how many other animals they kill, and they don't have the ability to manage that. When I was a kid growing up, when you went out for deer season, you never killed a doe. You had to kill only a buck, and you could only kill one. It was very rare if you got a doe tag. The state of Missouri Conservation Department has done their job so well now that there's an overpopulation of does, so they encourage hunters, you can kill a buck for your first kill, but if you see a doe, kill it, and if you want more doe tags, we'll give you all the doe tags. As many does as you can kill, we'll give you doe tags. Okay? Man has that ability to rule over his creation, God's creation. God has given us the ability to manage the fish of the sea, to manage the birds of the air, to manage cattle. God's given man the dominion and the intellect to be able to do that. It's a gift from God. I do not agree with these tree huggers. I don't know if you saw me hugging the tree. God does not give, I don't, I don't believe in their cause. I don't believe that it's wrong for man to set foot in nature. 
God has given man dominion over nature. Some evil men take advantage of that. I understand that. But then some right-thinking people saying, hey, we need to stop doing this. Look at that. We need to clean this up. Okay? And that's the gift God has given man. We, this earth is our gift. And God gives us not only the right to use it how we want, but the intellect to know when we've gone too far. Amen? Over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God has given that into our hand. So, 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. This is your Godhead right here. And by the way, the King James Bible is the only Bible that declares 1 John 5, 7. It is the only English translation that has that verse in it that says specifically that these three parts of the Godhead are in fact one. So when we're made in the image of God, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 tells us then, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even people who don't believe in God per se or God the way the Bible describes them as being three in one, the Godhead. Some of the New Agers still believe that humans have three parts. Only they always, I don't know if you've noticed, they always make it backwards. New Agers always talk about body, soul, and spirit. They put the body first and believe that the body is the most important part that if your body isn't right, then your soul and spirit won't be right. But I don't think the Bible teaches that at all. Um, If you ever wonder what yoga is all about, there's several things, and I'm not going to get too deep into it, But one of the things that I realized about why Hindus practice yoga, push yoga on people, and yoga has taken off, it's the belief that their body has to be in a certain condition physically in order to connect to the gods or a god. That if your body is not right, if your body's not exercised, if your body isn't in shape, if you don't have the strength, if you don't have the flexibility, if you don't do this and you don't, and if you eat meat and all of these rules that they enforce on you as a person, they believe that if your body isn't in tune right, then you cannot connect to God. But that our Bible says, lead the flesh out of it. Your body bodily exercise profiteth It's not how much I exercise physically that makes the difference on whether or not God's going to deal and commune with my spirit. In fact, God tells us that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Leave the flesh out of it. We do not. They believe they worship God by the condition of their flesh. We don't. And I'm kind of glad we don't. See, I have dominion over this wasp. Amen. Huh? He was not listening. So anyway, but the New Agers turn this around. They turn it backwards. They say that it's your mind, soul, and spirit, or your body, soul, and spirit, saying that your body is the most important part of that, and we just do not believe that. But anyway, your spirit, soul, and body, those are the three parts This is why God made us that way, because it matches. I mean, think about it. God is uh, spirit. He breathed into man his soul. Christ is, I guess you could say, that. in fact, the Bible says that um, in Jesus Christ dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when you have the spirit, soul, and body being a picture of the Godhead, You could say that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, the soul is God, the body within would be Jesus Christ. Blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 1. And what I'm doing is I'm showing you the connection 
that the Bible has with how this statement was made and why it was made this way. Um, and, I, and I want you to think about how God did this differently. When God wanted to make the birds of the air, God just said, let there be fowl in the heavens. When God wanted to make the fish of the sea, God said, let there be fish in the sea. He did not invoke the Godhead in, in what he said concerning the sun, the moon, the stars, the fish, the birds, the clouds, the firmament. He did not invoke the Godhead in, that, in the rest of the creation. Man is the only part of the creation where God brings in all the fullness of the Godhead. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis chapter 1, or excuse me, Romans chapter 1 verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. And what I believe is that every human who has ever lived on God's earth, down in their soul, knows who God is. That's what I believe. I've been asked the question more than once. Do you believe a native tribe living out in the jungle, never having contact with man for thousands of years, do you think when they die that they go to hell? It's not fair because they never knew about Jesus. They never knew about God. Why should they go to hell when they didn't know? And the answer is, yes, I believe they go to hell. The Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And right here, Romans chapter 1, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. I think down, maybe not in his mind or his flesh, but I think in man's soul, there is a knowing of who God is and then a rejection of who God is, a forgetting. Because every one of these river, forest civilizations that has not had any contact with man, did you know that they all have a religion? Every one of them has worshipped gods multiple gods all of them have where did they if they have not had contact with other civilizations where did they learn that there were gods where did they learn that they got it from somewhere and i think according to scripture i think that in their soul they forgot the true god and exchanged him, because that's what it says. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they're without excuse. Um, I don't know if I'll have it done by homecoming, but I'm working on a presentation about how the Godhead is seen in everything that God has made. Consider the Adam which they tell us everything is made of atoms. Atoms are always in three parts. Proton, neutron, and electron. Every atom is a proton, a neutron, an electron. Three. Everyone, everything that is, every piece of matter is made of atoms which are made of three parts. Protons, neutrons, electrons. That's the Godhead right there in the things that are clearly seen, okay? So that they are without excuse. So I think that whoever's lived on this earth, having spent a life worshiping other gods, I think when they stand before God in judgment, they will not be able to use the defense of ignorance. Because God said here, they are without excuse. Somehow, they knew it 
and rejected it. And I'm glad that we didn't. Amen? I've got more to share with you tonight, but I spent too much time giving my, my vacation slideshow. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you, I, I'm telling you, if you get a chance to save up your money and at least go to some place like Juneau, Alaska. There's nice hotels there, you can rent a car, and then you can go out and see these things. Or some other place in Alaska. Go look at the whales, go look at the trees, go find a bear somewhere. But go someplace where you can spend time looking at what God made. And then worship Him. Because it is a beautiful world that God has given. It's a good world that God has given man. Man's about to alter it significantly and ruin it. So enjoy it while we have it. Amen? Then the good news is the next one's going to be mind-blowingly better than this one. And I cannot even fathom, after having seen what I've seen this way, I cannot fathom then how much more beautiful heaven's going to be. But I think there's colors there that we can't even comprehend because we can't see them. That's what I think. Okay, let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> By the way, something happens between Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 9. And I'll share it with you now. In Genesis 1, God says clearly, I've given you all the herb bearing seed for your meat. In other words, see all these plants and all this fruit, and all that wheat? That's your food. Not animals. It wasn't until after the flood in Genesis 9 that God changes and says, See all these animals? You can eat them. Okay? Just don't drink their blood. So between Genesis 1 and Genesis 9, after the flood, God then gives an allowance to man start eating animals. Makes you wonder why. If you have an answer, I'd like to hear it. Next Sunday, all right?